And we're back! Hey everyone, uh, welcome back to the 21 Convention. Please give him a welcoming round of applause. Stand up if you feel like it and uh, <laughs> work on your posture uh, for him. James Steele II, ladies and gentlemen, here he comes. Cheers. Am I, am I good? Yeah. Cool. Okay guys, um, the first talk I'm going to do for you today, I'm going to do a talk tomorrow as well, going into a bit of specifics around my research and my kind of area of expertise, but one thing that Anthony's asked me to talk about is specifically philosophy and more specifically Ayn Rand's philosophy, which is objectivism. Um, I'm a big proponent of Ayn Rand's philosophies. I first got introduced to Atlas Shrugged through reading kind of Mike Mentzer's work, so I don't know if any of you are familiar with Mike Mentzer, heavy duty, high intensity training. Coming from an exercise physiology background, I first got involved with that after getting involved with Arthur Jones, moving through all that, yada yada yada. And um, realized that he applied a very sort of philosophical approach to his pursuit of knowledge in that specific area. And I kind of got, got more involved, learned the name Ayn Rand, found her works, read Atlas Shrugged for the first time a year, or, a year and a half or so ago, and it really kind of resounded with me, the message in it and the underlying philosophy made me want to learn more about it and learn about how to apply it in my life and you know, essentially how to live my life. So what I'm going to do today is kind of go through, if you can see the slides, hopefully, if not, then you just have to rely on me speaking and hopefully, hopefully it will go, for, go through fine. Um, I, I ended up writing a bit of an essay for my notes because I didn't want to leave any kind of like stone unturned. I felt that there was so much depth that needs to kind of be go, gone into with the specifics of the philosophy and learning how the fundamentals all affect each other that I needed quite a lot of detail in it. So I apologize if it looks like I'm kind of relying on my notes a lot. I was kind of hoping for a, a podium or something to kind of maybe, you know, speak from, but I'm going to have to kind of re rely on uh, just, just holding it here now. So, so excuse, excuse that anyway. James, you're welcome to move the thing you have there if you want. Yeah, would that work? Cool. Um, uh, I don't know. I'll, I'll hold it and see how I go, actually. Uh, yeah. I'll try not to wave it around too much, though. Oh, I think I have been already. Um, OK, so like I said, I, I'm a PhD student. My specific area is exercise physiology, lower back pain, and how the two are related. But philosophy, for me, is a, is a big interest. So this talk is, uh, just to clarify, I have no academic training in philosophy at all. Everything I've learned is self-taught. So that's why I've kind of made the clarification. This is, this is an armchair philosopher's perspective. I, I'm self-taught taught in this and I, I've went out and sought the information much like you guys are coming to this convention learning about the various topics that the speakers are talking on. So I want to kind of share that with you. Okay, so just to kind of give you a brief outline, I'm, I tend to do academic conferences just because of PhD stuff so everything has, a, has an outline so excuse the formatting if, it, if it's a bit sort of like bland. Okay, so, so first of all we're going to clarify like what is, what is philosophy and, and you know why is it even important you know why do we need to know about philosophy you know is, is it self-evident or is it kind of subconscious or do we need a conscious awareness of it and how it pertains to our lives then we're going to go through and actually introduce objectivism as a philosophy in itself and we're going to go through all the various different areas of objectivism through a kind of logical approach and we're going to discuss what logic is and how it kind of like works into the philosophy as well. So we're going to go through the main sort of areas, metaphysics, epistemology, ethics, and politics. And we're going to see how they kind of all interrelate and build what Ayn Rand called a philosophy for life on earth. And like Anthony said, life on earth as a man is what this conference is about. I'm just going to quickly sit my glasses on because I can't, I'm short sighted, I can't read the screen. <laughs> and I like to be able to see it. That's not going to affect the lights at all, is it going to reflect too much? That's better, I can see it, and I can see all you now. Everything was blurry before. And then we're going to kind of conclude just by looking at the kind of simple choices that we face in our lives and the very sort of like um, prominent conflicts that have a philosophical origin and how we can use this structure of philosophy to kind of like this, uh, kind of figure out what choices we need to make when it comes to these conflicts and what choices are, are, are most appropriate. Okay, so first of all, what is philosophy and, and, and why is it important? Philosophy pertains to everything and, and this, this quote from Ayn Rand sums it up very well. Philosophy studies the fundamental nature of existence and of man and of, of, man and of man's relationship to existence. So fundamentally, 
philosophy deals with how you live your life and how, how you relate to the world around, around you as a man or as an individual. You know, if you wish to live your life, you can't avoid the necessity of philosophy. Philosophy underpins everything. Man's life relies upon philosophy if he's to know how he should live it. You know, everything you do, every action you take, assumes some underlying principles by which you take those actions. Some fundamental principles. And that's what philosophy predominantly deals with. It deals with fundamentals. The basic, irreducible, primary concepts that kind of dictate how we live our lives. Like I said, the choices we make, what we do, how we think, how we act, how we live. You know, some exa examples could, could pertain to you guys coming to this conference here. You want to learn something. You want to learn something about the nature of reality. You want to learn something about particular subjects, particular topics. You want to know how to apply it. You know, it could be anything. Success with women, starting a successful business, entrepreneurship, exercise, nutrition. What philosophy deals with is what that subject is, how it relates to you, and how you actually find out that information and know what's true and what actually works. You know, how, how reality it works. Essentially, it's how to live. Yeah, briefly then, uh, what Ayn Rand is um, predominantly an author, and she had this vision of, like Anthony said, uh, of man as a hero, man as an individual, man living his life as he deems by his own standards and for his own pursuit of happiness. And she wrote several novels, including At the Shrugged, which is my personal favourite, and uh, I was so, you know, I've got such a conviction about the philosophy that I, I went as far as having the, the tattoo of Atlas on, on my arm. Um, Fountainhead, which I know is Anthony's personal favourite. Um, there's actually a film about it, I haven't seen it, but it's supposed to be really good. Um, and and other, other various novels which she wrote before then delving into, well, people saw, read her novels, and they were aware that, that the heroes she kind of had in her novels, that, you know, the businessmen, the successful people, were different to what predominant sort of like doctrine and, and dogma and conventional wisdom, whatever that is, that we all kind of like try and combat by coming to this thing. Um, she kind of like showed this kind of like completely, para, uh, completely um, independent hero and people wanted to know, well, you know, what, what, under, what philosophy, you know, can you explain it in more detail? What philosophy underlies your stories and what philosophy underlies your heroes? What philosophy underlies man in your vision? Um, so that, that's what Ayn Rand did, and, and she built upon that um, by writing more philosophical texts to, to explain her philosophy. And that's what I'm going to try and do justice to, to today. So there'll be a few quotes by Ayn Rand, um, uh, some of them from her novels and some of them from her, her philosophical works. Okay, so like I was saying, philosophy underpins life, essentially. Now, for most of you, you know, you may not have a, you know, real deep interest in understanding particular philosophical constructs and philosophical frameworks. You know, you may not have an interest in going out of your way yourself to kind of like search the literature, read the books and that sort of thing. But regardless of whether you want to go out of your way and learn it, you've got to appreciate that it, it underpins everything you do. Every action you take, every action that anyone else takes, your perspective on reality is dictated by your philosophical principles, whether you're consciously aware of them or not. This quote by um, the economist John Maynard Keynes, I think, despite his touchy uh, economic theories, um, I think it quite, quite well sums up that kind of situation. He says, and I quote, the ideas of economists and political philosophers, both when they are right and when they are wrong, are more powerful than is commonly understood. Indeed, the world is ruled by little else. Practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influence are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. And economist there is, is synonymous with, with philosopher. Economy is dictated by philosophical principles, much like everything else. Ayn Rand had her own quote as well, which she used. Who sets the tone of a culture? A small handful of men, the philosophers. Others follow their lead either by conviction or by default. So where, where I present the philosophical framework today, I want you guys to understand it and either accept or reject it based on your own convictions. Uh, hopefully I'll do a good enough job to persuade you all. So, introducing objectivism. Most people who kind of have any sort of like perception of philosophy have a very sort of like superficial one. They don't really go into the details of it. They know the conflicts that are that exist in this kind of world, but they don't really kind of like reduce it down to what the base principles are and how that affects things. They see these various conceptual conflicts and never really work it out. Now, 
Dr. Onkar Gatte, I don't know if any of you have heard of him, but that's irrelevant. But he's a, a fellow at the Ayn Rand Institute, which is an educational establishment for helping um, portray Ayn Rand's philosophical ideas. Um, he did, a, did a, a lecture similar to what I'm doing now on introducing objectivism, and he used a kind of format where he uh, reduced the latter conflicts that we see in today's world, which we'll discuss in, in more detail as we go through, back to their irreducible fundamentals, the kind of primaries, the fundamentals that the philosophy deals with. Now, in the structure of his lecture, there was a kind of contextual um, series of lectures that discussed these topics in, in detail beforehand, so it was very easy to kind of do that. But what I wanted to do was show you that there's actually a logical process by which we can start at the beginning and move towards the end and figure out how to, how to make the choices that come up in these later conflicts. So, I use the exa example. In 1962, at, at the Shrug Sales Conference, Ayn Rand was asked to stand on one foot and give the basics of her philosophy. And so she did as follows. She said, metaphysics is objective reality. Epistemology, reason, ethics, self-interest, or rational self-interest to be more appropriate. And politics is capitalism or individualism. Now, I think she was uh, acutely aware of the order in which she mentioned those, because that was the exact order in which she mentioned them, metaphysics, epistemology, ethics, politics. And I, th I think, although she didn't explicitly state it, she was acutely aware of this process of logic by which each preceding branch of uh, 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 sorry, philosophy actually linked in to the next branch of philosophy and created this framework by which we can answer all of these questions. So. What I want to do, do is go through it in this logical process, starting with metaphysics, working through to epistemology, ethics, and ending on politics, and showing you how the answers we get from each preceding branch dictates the answers we should get in the next branch of philosophy. So we'll discuss each of the conflicts that kind of arise then. So, starting with metaphysics. Any discussion of philosophy has to start with metaphysics, if, if you will. It, it's the most fundamental of fundamentals, if that kind of makes sense. Metaphysics deals with the fundamental nature of reality, you know, the universe as a whole, as it, as it exists, as we perceive it, basically reality, you know, it's, it's no simpler way to, dicta to express it than that. And what it de deals with uh, most specifically is axioms or axiomatic concepts. Now, those axioms are usually considered self-evident truths. That is, it, they're obvious. We don't need any clarification from them. But the problem with that is it kind of dictates or, or presumes that there's some sort of omniscience or omnipotence that gives us knowledge without our perception of it, without our actual creation of it. The thing is, axioms are graphs conceptually, as is all of our knowledge, which we'll discuss at some point. You can perceive reality, but to understand it, you have to conceptualise it. Now, the basic concepts that we deal with, deal with when setting up this philosophical framework are the axiomatic concepts of existence, identity and consciousness. Now, our perception of reality as it exists is fundamentally dictated by these concepts. That existence exists and it has an identity and that you're conscious of its existence. <clears throat> the combination of the concepts leads to the following statement. Something exists of which I'm conscious and I must discover its identity. Now some other philosophers, I don't know if any of you are aware of René Descartes, no? I'm sure you've probably all heard the phrase, I think therefore I am. Yeah? Bullshit. Fundamentally wrong. The problem with it is, is that statement suggests that our act of being conscious of perceiving reality is what creates reality. That's fundamentally wrong. Consciousness is an attribute, it's an identity. We are an existent, we're man, and we have consciousness as a characteristic. We exist independent of consciousness. Some people aren't conscious, yet they still exist. We don't create consciousness through our perception of reality. And so these axioms are explicit in any states of, of awareness. The statement, I am, therefore I think, it's probably more appropriate. Now, some, some people would argue that 
these concepts are arbitrary in themselves, much like, like Descartes' statement that reality is created by our consciousness. But the problem here is anyone who tries to disprove these concepts has to, by necessity, invoke them to disprove them. You can't disprove existence from non-existence. You can't disprove consciousness from unconsciousness. There's, it's a logical contradiction. So you can't logically argue against these axioms. They're self-evident in the respect that existence exists and we're conscious of it. So, what is logic? Logic is non-contradictory identification. If you try and argue that consciousness doesn't exist, you have to argue it from a state of consciousness. You can't, and that's a contradiction, because you're invoking that you yourself don't exist, or your consciousness doesn't exist. It just doesn't make sense. Anyway. So Ayn Rand kind of used this statement, or Aristotle originally used this statement, that A is A, or existence exists. Something is what it is, and it can't be nothing else. It may have a specific identity, and that you may be able to find out by that. It's its characteristics. We are man, we exist, we have consciousness as an identity. So, the primary conflict in any philosophical framework, metaphysically, is always whether we accept the original axiom that existence exists, or whether we accept non-existence. It's existence versus non-existence. And really, there's only one choice that we can make. So fundamentally, all philosophical frameworks have to be dictated by the fact that existence exists and we're conscious of it. So Ayn Rand summed it up in layman's terms as nature to be commanded must be obeyed. Nice and simple. It doesn't matter what your wishes, whims, feelings are. Existence exists independent of those. You can't wish that something's going to fall from the sky or wish that you're going to be, be successful. You have to adhere to the principles of reality. You have to do things that you know and you can learn are going to make a difference and you know that are going to exert an effect based upon the fundamental nature of reality and your relationship to it. Just a quote from Atlas Shrugged then, my favourite book. Existence exists, and the act of grasping that statement implies two corollary axioms, that something exists which one perceives, and that one exists possessing consciousness, consciousness being the faculty of perceiving that which exists. And I think that sums it up very well, well, I've hopefully summed up quite well anyway. We'll see. Right, moving on from metaphysics then, and that fundamental conflict of existence versus non-existence, we can move on to epistemology. First of all, what is epistemology? Epistemology is quite literally the study of knowledge and it asks various questions such as what is knowledge? What you know, not what you believe or what you wish, but what you actually know, what you know is true. How we acquire knowledge, you know, what process do we utilise that actually results in us knowing something, knowing that something is true, knowing that something is correct, knowing a fact of reality. And how do we know what we know? Where does our knowledge actually come from? Does it come from reality? Or does it come from some omniscient, some omnipotent being who knows all independent of reality? To know something is true is to be certain in the context of existing information that something is true. One thing to accept, first of all, is even though we can accept that existence exists, the fact that our perception of it is correct is by no means a given. We, we're infallible, unfortunately. You know, we could perceive things incorrectly. So it's interesting, to, it's important to understand that the knowledge we have is based in concepts, but those concepts could be based on flawed perceptions. So, to say something is true is always in the basis of existing knowledge, the current context of your knowledge, the extent of your knowledge. And also to say something that is, is knowledge implies that you can prove it, that you've got evidence in reality of that existing. Okay, so like I said, knowledge is conceptual and its validity depends on concepts. So, what is our knowledge based on then? Initially, all, all knowledge is based on percep our perceptual level of awareness, our consciousness, our awareness of reality. We perceive reality through our consciousness and we get information from reality about the nature of of something existing and, and of its identity, of its characteristics. So how do we perceive reality? We use two forms of forms. We have our senses, which is our cognition, and we have measurements as well. Now, measurements are important. 
because at a perceptual level, we can only perceive so much. You know, you can see the pillars, walls, you can see everyone next to you. But we know from measurement and from the application of science that things exist on a smaller level than we can actually directly perceive. And things exist on a larger scale than we can directly bear witness to and perceive as well. But we can still know about them because we can apply a process of mathematics and science and use a process of measurement to understand our relationship to the very small and very big as well. So, to assume that all knowledge is based on our senses is incorrect. It's based upon cognition, our senses and measurement, our application of a method of mathematics and science to it. The next stage of knowledge is always how we form concepts. So we perceive reality as existence. We perceive individuals, we perceive individual parts of reality. Then what we do is we learn its identity, i.e. its characteristics, and we draw relationships between it. So for example, all of you out there, you're all men, and I can see that, but you're all individuals as well. You're all individual existence, but there are various characteristics that are related between you all that I can draw links from and form the concept of man. You're all men, yet you're all individuals at the same time. This is how we kind of like integrate further knowledge into our minds. Instead of just looking at you all and individually picking out each individual person, I can create the concept in my mind of man, and understand that that incorporates everyone in this room. There's no other women in this room, is there? No. So that's kind of how we can build upon our knowledge, and it's how our knowledge works. Existent, learning its identity, forming it into a unit, and extrapolating from that into a concept. And we create our concepts via those means. Now, if anyone wants to learn more about epistemology, I understand it's not exactly the most exciting concept, uh, uh, or subject rather then I would recommend reading Ayn Rand's book, An Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology. This is a basic kind of glazing over it, but it highlights the main point that our knowledge is based in reality. Our knowledge is based on what exists rather than what doesn't exist or what we want to exist or what we wish exists. So the primary conflict in epistemology always comes down to reason and faith. And another quote to kind of highlight that. Reason integrates man's perceptions by means of forming abstractions or conceptions, thus raising man's knowledge from perceptual level, which he shares with other animals, to the conceptual level, which he alone can reach. The method which reason employs in this process is called logic, and logic is the art of non-contradictory identification. So like we said, it's about the ability to perceive reality and draw relationships between objects and not to contradict yourself in the process. Faith is not based in reality, unfortunately. Faith can never claim to hold knowledge. I don't want to piss anyone off who holds faith as some sort of value, but this is my, my perception, and if you... Well, I do mean to interrupt you, but um, the logic, surely that is a faith in itself. Logic? Yeah, you were saying that faith is bullshit. You're <laughs> having faith in that logic, so... That would be... The problem is, is coming back to what we base epistemology on, what we base how we gain knowledge on. So we go back to the original metaphysics of existence versus non-existence. To state that faith is, faith is, is knowledge independent of, of existence. So that implies that the initial choice that we've made metaphysically is that existence doesn't exist that existence is, is a, a, in constant flux, that we can't know anything about it, or that we can know independent of our relationship to existence. We can just know without seeing, without perceiving, without measuring. We can just have knowledge like that without any means of actually obtaining it. It just comes to us. So, like I said, said though, that initial conflict, to disagree with it or to try and disprove it is to contradict it in itself. You can't prove that existence doesn't exist from a position of non-existence, or that consciousness doesn't exist from a position of unconsciousness. It's like the, the inherent ability, and, and from a quote from Anthony's blog, or paraphrasing it, you know, it, it's like trying to argue against the inherent ability to argue. Yeah. It, it's a contradiction in itself. Yeah. And that's what it com comes down to. There's no really two ways about it. If you try and prove otherwise, then the burden of proof is on, on you. But you can't do so unless you've got unless you choose that platform from which to prove it from. Okay, sure. Cool. Where was I? Right, yeah, so the conflict epistemology, epistemologically then, 
is always reason versus faith and how you obtain your knowledge. Do you obtain your knowledge by means of perceiving existence and learning about the real, the true nature, the facts of reality? Or do you just assume that knowledge is just going to come to you, independent of what you do, or by your wishes, whims, feelings, etc.? Now, moving on then to potentially some touchy subjects, but we'll, we'll see. Um, predominantly in today's world, the, the philosophical conflicts most people would deal with are not going to be metaphysics or epistemological. But, like I said, they pro form the process of determining logically what choices we should make in latter conflicts. And those latter conflicts usually end up being ethical or political, or they're certainly the ones that people are consciously aware of. So, we'll discuss ethics then, and we'll kind of move on to the conflicts that predominantly perfuse today's society. So, first of all, when we're talking about ethics, we're talking about morality. And we first need to uh, identify what morality is and also what ethics is, because the two are intertwined. And the morality, as it states, is a code of values to guide man's choices and actions. Now, if we think about it logically, that implies that we've made a certain set of choices metaphysically and epistemologically first, which we'll then move into as well. They necessarily dictate the choices we'll make ethically and then politically as well. And ethics is essentially the process of learning what those value, values are and trying to set that code of values, what our morality is and what we hold as valuable to our own lives. So you might think that primarily ethics deals with asking the question what values are, you know, what should those values be? But before that, that presupposes that there's an answer to the question of value to whom and why. And like I said, that draws on the earlier concept, uh, conflicts of existence versus non-existence and reason versus faith. So first then, why? Why does man need a code of values? Why does he need a moral compass to guide his life? To know what's good, what's evil? Is that arbitrary or is it based in reality? If we accept that we've chosen reality as an absolute and existence exists, we can hopefully try and determine what a rational code of ethics is. So, in the realm of ethics, we've got something called meta-ethics, and it's kind of like metaphysics, but it deals with the na nature of where ethics come from, where our code of morals come from, where our code of values come from, and the ethics we choose. Now, historically and predominantly, most people would consider that ethics came from either God, some omniscient, omnipotent being that could just dictate what we should do and what we shouldn't do, or from society so-called normative ethics, the collective ethics, the ethics which society thinks you should do, the values which society determines you should have, not the values which you choose yourself. Now, I, I don't necessarily want to kind of like focus on the specific mysticism involved and faith involved with religion. I don't want to touch on any touchy areas like religion. If you want to come talk to me after, after about it, then that's fine, but I'm not going to stand here and talk about it now. Um, but I will point out the arbitrariness of the construct society if society is necessarily the source of ethics and therefore the source of values, that which is good is determined by what society wants to be good or thinks is good or votes is good, what the majority think is good. But the problem is society is only a collection of individuals. There's no collective mind, there's no collective person, there's no collective man, there's only you, me, him, her, whatever. There's no collective mind, there's only individual minds, there's only individual men. The problem with society as a source of ethics is that the majority are generally entitled to determine what is good and it's moral for them to determine what is good regardless of its content and the minority are usually obliged to follow and that's considered moral, that's considered valuable regardless of the content, regardless of what the values chosen are, regardless of what, whether it conflicts with your existence. So if we want to change the predominant kind of pattern of thought, it's these issues that we need to tackle, but we need to base them in existence. We need to base them in metaphysics and epistemology. So we should start again by asking the question, well, what are values? You know, why does man need them? So what are values then? Another quote, I like quotes. Value is that which one acts to gain and or keep. The concept value is not a primary. It presupposes an answer to the question of value to whom and for what. 
It presupposes an entity capable of acting to achieve a goal in the face of an alternative, where no alternative exists, no goals and no values are possible. So Ayn Rand always used a good quote that an indestructible killer robot, not necessarily killer, but an indestructible robot is, never has to face the choice of whether it's going to live or die. It's indestructible. So therefore, it can't hold any values. Why should man even need values? As, can everyone kind of read that? It's a bit small. I'll read it out anyway. There is only one fundamental alternative in the universe. And this is kind of coming back to the idea of the indestructible robot. Existence or non-existence, and it pertains to a single class of entities, to living organisms. The existence of inanimate matter is unconditional. The existence of life is not. It depends upon a specific course of action. Matter is indestructible. It changes forms, but it cannot cease to exist. It is only a living organism that faces a constant alternative, the issue of life or death. Life is a process of self-sustaining and self-generating action. If, organ if an organism fails in that action, it dies. Its chemical elements remain, but its life goes out of existence. It is only the concept of life that makes the concept of value possible. It is only to a living entity that things can be good or evil. The indestructible robot can't die. You guys can. And the, that's the reason why man needs values, because man's values only come from the fact that you're alive. That is your highest value. It's the source of all your values, your life, man's life. Man's life is the ultimate standard of value. It's the, it's the goalpost or the, the, the measuring post by which you judge all other values because it makes all others possible. Man's life or man is an end in itself, in himself. Now, if we kind of think epistemologic, epistemologically about ethics, then we can consider how we come to those concepts. Initially, knowledge always starts perceptually, and for man, that might be pleasure or pain, suffering or happiness. So perceptually, whatever actions we take may either be happy, may create happiness, sadness, whatever. We know whether something's good or evil, or we perceive whether something's good or evil, predominantly for our senses by those means. But, as we've seen, that's never an automatic process. It has to be based in reality. We can't just accept that our per perceptions are necessarily correct either. Like we said, we need to use a method of reason, a method of measurement, and we need to know, know whether or not they're right. So, if man's life is the highest value he can hold, then he has to figure out a way of maintaining that life. He has to answer questions such as, how do I get food? How do I get shelter? How do I survive? On, on the most basic level, I know that doesn't necessarily apply in today's society. Some of those things are kind of, they just kind of are there. But you still have to act upon them. So the principles are the same. Now, the problem is, does he choose reason or faith to try and achieve those goals? Does he choose to accept that existence exists and he can learn about it and learn how to manipulate it and learn how to act upon it to get the goals, he, to achieve the goals he wants and to achieve the sustainment of his life and therefore of all his other values? Or does he choose faith? Does he just hope that things will happen somehow? Now, I've got a quote which is kind of usually used as a bit of a dig at religion, but it kind of appropriately highlights this, I think. So... Forget the word religion, just put mysticism or faith or whatever you want to put in there. Now, <laughs> I'm going to read this out to you because I kind of read along a little bit. The man who gets, a, gets given a fish never learns where that fish comes from, how he can obtain it. He never gains any knowledge past the extent of, a man gave me a fish. And so we'll be left with the answer, with the answer to the question of where or how do I get more fish as somewhere, somehow. This man is living his life through the means of another, waiting for more fish. He will die when no one attempts to give him more fish. The man who accepts mysticism, mysticism, religion's mystic, but I don't know, too touchy. The man who accepts mysticism does, not attempt to, does attempt to gain more fish, sorry, but he chooses to ignore the facts of reality and instead presumes to ask something or someone whom he can never know exists to provide him with fish. 
He will die when the consequences of reality catch up with him and he finds that fish don't rain from the sky or appear in his hands because he wants it to or wishes it to or prays to someone to give it to him, prays to God or society or whatever. The man who learns to fish, however, whether he's taught or he seeks that knowledge himself, it's irrelevant, he gains knowledge. He learns about the fundamental nature of reality. He learns where to catch fish, he learns where to uh, how to catch fish and where to catch them. He learns that by using his knowledge and applying the facts of reality, he can provide himself with food and importantly, actively be productive in sustaining his life and therefore sustaining all the values that stem from his life. So if life is a standard and if knowledge is power, and if reason is man's only means of, ta of obtaining knowledge and therefore of survival, that which is proper to a rational, reasonable human being is what's good, and that which goes against that is what's evil, fundamentally. The man has, to, has a choice. He has to choose whether to use reason or faith or whether to accept existence or non-existence as his fundamentals. The problem is some men don't choose to do that, and it's pretty prevalent in society nowadays. Now, Ayn Rand had a good sort of two words she used to de uh, denote these men. She called them the moochers, and the looters. The survival of the moochers and looters is dependent on reason, but only indirectly. They use force or act as parasites to steal the knowledge of other men, to force other men to think for them, to provide for them, to sustain their lives. They never live through their own lives, they always live through the means of other men. So even their survival is indirectly necess necessitated by reason. They try and live independently of it, but they can't. It's impossible. You can't deny existence and then try and live in reality. The problem is, though, they try and live on a whim. They try and live on this faith-based reality that somehow, somewhere, someone will provide for them. Someone will sustain their life. And the problem is the range of their survival is always dictated by the range of their victims. The more and more they suck, the more and more they steal, the more and more they take from other people without any value in return, eventually those victims die. And as soon as reason stops, they die too. They always live on the range of a moment. They never project. They never view their own goals and view the means of how to obtain them in reality themselves by gaining knowledge about it and learning how to achieve those goals. I was going to use a kind of quote for, or paraphrase what Matt Hussey said in that video you put on the, yeah. on the convention. The moochers and looters, they're the destroyers. The men of reason, you guys hopefully, you're the creators. You create your own lives. You create the means of sustaining your own lives. Fuck yeah. <laughs> Fuck yeah. The destroyers choose death. You guys choose life. The men of reason choose life and how to sustain it. They choose life and they choose its corresponding values, the values which make life possible and which stem from life. Reason, purpose, and self-esteem. If man desires to live, he has to be purposely productive. He has to purposely sustain his own life, achieve his own goals. So productiveness is his central purpose. His purpose is to sustain his own life. Reason is the means of doing that, learning about the nature of reality and how to manipulate, how to dictate it, how to apply it and how to achieve your goals, and pride's the result. Feeling good about yourself, feeling good that you achieved your goals, feeling good that you lived your own life, feeling good that you achieved values that you necessitate as value. Now these values have corresponding virtues as well. And for reason, rationality is the virtue of reason. It's the recognition that reason is man's only source of knowledge, and it's the application of that consistently. Purpose. Productiveness is the recognition that productive work is the process by which man sustains his life, whether great or modest, it is any rational pursuit, any pursuit that is dependent upon your knowledge of existence, your reason. And self-esteem, pride. Pride is the recognition that man's life is worth sustaining, it's moral ambition, never accepting irrational values, never practicing irrational virtues, never failing to hold rational values and practicing their virtues, never accepting unearned guilt if one does earn, and if one does earn it, never leaving it uncorrected, 
never resigning passively to one's flaws of character, never placing any concern over one's own self-esteem, one's own life, and most importantly, never accepting the role of a slave or sacrificial animal like the moochers and looters would want you to. Live for your own life, don't live for theirs. Psychologically though, we don't tend to face those problems. We don't face life and death all the time unless you're like Anthony and you walk in front of cars. Instead, man faces the problem of happiness or suffering. And I always like this quote, achieving life is not the equivalent of avoiding death. See, the moochers, they achieve life, or sorry, they, they avoid death rather, to a degree, until their victims die, until the men of reason decide to run away, go on strike, John Galt. But let me kind of clarify that. Man's happiness is his own proper, is the proper state of his existence. You know that you're living your life correctly if you're happy, like Anthony said. And you don't have to necessarily express that unless you think it's valuable to express that to other people and you express it in the presence of people who are worthy of that happiness. You know, I'm really happy to be here with you guys. Like, I'm really happy to be here presenting at the convention. But I may not necessarily be jumping around doing dances and backflips and smiling and whatnot. So to create happiness is to create a life that's worth, that you deem is worth living. It's to stand there doing what you do, doing what's productive to you, and to say, this is worth living for. This is why I'm living. This is what I enjoy. This is what makes me happy. This is what sustains my life. This is valuable to me. And this is what is worth living for. So when, man's consi when you consider the fact that Logically, existence exists, reason is our means of perceiving it, and happiness is man's proper goal in life. We have to consider that the, the only sort of rational code of morality is our own long-term rational self-interest. We have to project, view our goals, know what's going to make us happy, what's going to succeed, what's going to help us succeed, how we can achieve the goals and how we can live our own life and achieve our own happiness. So long-term rational self-interest, projecting, viewing goals, that sort of thing is what's important. Uh, ah, and I was going to make a clarification. So one of the things um, that some philosophers use as a counter-argument to this idea of self-interest or selfishness, because it's got such a dogma associated with the word, is some people view hedonism as being selfish. Hedonism is, is living for the purpose of pleasure, living for the purpose of, of happiness, but only on the range of a moment. It considers that any, anything that produces acute happiness, you know, happiness on a short scale is good and anything that doesn't is bad. But the problem is it doesn't consider the long-term impact of things. You know, drawing a kind of ex example, nutritionally, because it's quite easy to do, some things taste good and they feel good and they make you feel happy when you eat them. But you might know that, that they're shit for your health. So should that necessarily dictate you know, whether or not you choose to eat those things, whether or not you choose that as a goal, whether or not you choose your health as a goal, your life as a goal. Being hedonistic and just gorging on pizza and shit, you know, you might enjoy it, but it's going to catch up with you and eventually you're going to be unhappy. It's failing to see your long-term happiness and long-term success in your life. And it applies to anything, but that's just the example that I could think of at the time. So it's avoiding living on the range of the, of the moment. It's considering, it's projecting, seeing where you're going, having a vision of the future, like Anthony mentioned for the conference. You guys should have a vision of your own future. You should have an ideal that you can project and try and create in reality by accepting the nature of reality and learning about it and applying it. Uh, I thought it was quite appropriate in dealing with ethics and it being a bit of a pickup convention? No, 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 I didn't mean to say that. Um, that, you, that. A lot of you guys are probably here for the kind of like pickup and, and relationships and, and that sort of thing. And obviously a lot of the speakers, speakers are. I thought ethically it would, be, um, it would be inappropriate to avoid the issue of love and, and what, what love really is as a, as a concept. So, ethically, what of love? Lovely picture there. Fundamentally, to love is to value. Now, I go into a bit of a debate over whether or not love is an emotion or whether or not love is a, a concept that we've created to denote our value of something. And I, th I think it's the latter. And I think if you guys are familiar with any of Nathaniel Brandon's works, 
as far as I'm aware, he kind of has the same sort of line of thought. Lo love is, is the value, and I think that's actually his own quote. Yeah, yeah. So, I, only a man with an unyielding, uncompromised standard of value can even begin to consider love. If, lo if the love is the value, you have to have that measuring post by which you deem what is valuable. And if that's your own life, and you've got the self-esteem to be able to say that your own life is that standard of value, then you've got the means by which to judge whether or not something is valuable to yourself and whether or not you truly love it. If a man does not value himself, how can he value anything else? Love is a judgment of value. It's to say in your mind that what you love is valuable to you and your life and your happiness. To love without condition is to not love at all. By loving everyone equally, without any judgment of the value to your life they represent, you effectively love no one. It makes love, it inflates love as a concept. It makes it unvaluable. How am I doing for time? You have about 15, 20 minutes. Okay, should be good. I feel like this is going on for ages. Okay, so. so topic, huh? I think you had a very important topic. Yeah. Well, um, okay, so moving on from love, love, talking about relationships. Necessarily, we have to move on to the idea of rights and what are rights. Socially, they're how man recognizes morality in other men. If man's life is an end in itself, he has to recognize that fact in every man, because every man is a man, every man is an existent, and every man necessarily has the same code of values, or should have the same code of values, and the same moral value measuring post. So to attempt to not recognize that, or, or to not recognize that in another man, is to contradict that it exists in yourself, and that that's your standard of value. So, like I say, rights are the means of recognising the unavoidable fact in man's dealings with each other. Excuse me. So, the primary conflict then, when it comes to ethics and what determines rights and what determines how you should live your life and make your choices ethically and what is moral, what is valuable, is your own rational self-interest, whether you live for the sake of your own life, or whether you live for your own goals and your own happiness, or whether you live for the sake of others, which is altruism. Now, just to clarify, usually people use the, look at the conflict of egoism versus altruism, but, and I was actually talking to someone, I can't remember who, about, um, I think it was, actually he's not here, um, about this idea of um, Nietzschean egoism. And I, I like to, kind of keep that separate and I'll go into the, into the reasons why in ju just a moment just because egoism from Nietzsche's point of view is irrational and I'll explain why in, in just a moment. So the conflict from rational self-interest to altruism is, is ask the question, you know, is man a rational an animal? Does man have a right to his own life and his own interests? You know, or is he obligated to live for the sake of others? as a slave to any dictator, any omnipotent being that's some arbitrary construct, or to society itself, to the majority of others, to the mob rule of dem democracy. Ethics should be distinct from a democracy. It doesn't have a rightful place in there because that holds that whatever the majority says is good, is moral, and whatever the minority say. Good question. Yep. The question is, uh, does democracy have a place in government, though? Is there a proper use for it? I think there is a proper purpose for it, in, but it definitely doesn't relate to any form of ethical system. So things, so like things that aren't optional, things so that it's are useful. Optional. It's useful. The it's nature useful of reality for and, the, and the nature of man's um, code of values, unfortunately, certainly from my perspective and from hopefully the way I've presented it to you guys today, it, it's not a matter of choice. It is, it is a necessity of, of reality. And when it comes to government, and we'll, I'll, I'll briefly go into politics, although I don't want to kind of dwell on it too much in this talk, um, is it, it should, should only pertain to things that are purely optional, things that don't have an impact on, um, directly on whether or not man can achieve his own life, his, his own liberty and his own happiness. 
So, and, I, and in fact, I was going to suggest that any of you guys haven't read it, you should read Anthony's blog post, uh, Liberty Unlocked, Declarationism. Um, I was going to go on to suggesting that anyway, because he does a, does a great job of um, kind of debunking the whole bullshit that is government that exists nowadays. Is that good? Yeah, yeah. Yeah? I was, I was getting that, so. yeah? yeah? Cool. Okay. Um, Okay, yeah, so, like I said, I wanted to clarify Nietzschean self-interest uh, self or egoism to Rand's concept of, of egoism. You know, selfishness is quite literally concerned with your own interests. And one of the reasons that Ayn Rand uses that is because she likes to be quite she liked to be quite controversial and she liked the fact that it did stir, the stigma that was attached to it did stir this kind of, like, um, response in people. But... And, and, you know, the proponents of, of altruism, the people who say that you are your brother's key, keeper, that you, you should live for our others, have tried to sort of like demonise the term and create this imagery of a brute who goes around, you know, metaphorically or even not metaphorically with a club to basically just take what he wants, irrespective of his recognition of anyone else's rights or to their own life and liberty and happiness. And essentially that's Nietzsche's form of egoism. He, he suggests that anything that's good for yourself is good just because you deem it good for yourself, regardless of whether or not you can accept that fact in another person. It comes back to this um, idea, idea of rights. Nietzsche recognises that life is, is your own standard of living and anything that is good to you is good rather than evil, regardless of the means of getting there. He ignores the means of getting there and he ignores the means of the fact that it's a contradiction if he fails to recognise the fact that my life is my own, your life is your own, your life is your own. He fails to recognise the fact that that is evident in every man. So I try to avoid using the word egoism just because some people relate that to Nietzsche's concept of it. This idea of a guy going around with a gun or a club and just taking whatever he wants and that being good. Also I wanted to clarify that some people see benevolence and self-interest as independent from each other. You know, a lot of the, the altruists and the people who follow those sorts of doctrines and the government officials and, and leaders and stuff who, who tell you these sorts of things kind of try and make it clear that, oh, you know, the, the business leaders and whatnot, they're, they're only out for themselves and, and that's all they do. They, you know, they can't do anything good for, each other, for another person. But, you know, they, they've got no, you know, Apple or whatever or, or Microsoft or whatever. Everything they do, they're doing it for themselves. But there's an act of benevolence there as well by making a product available making you know providing value to other people as well so one thing to understand is that self-interest is not independent of benevolence you know by standing here today i'm doing a kind of like act of benevolence by providing you guys hopefully with some interesting information and something useful but i do it out of purely self-interest it's not a contradiction you know it's in my interest to see young men like you educated on these sorts of topics and these sorts of principles because you guys and myself and, and people here you know we're the next generation we're the guys who are going to shape the world we're the next set of philosophers who are going to dictate you know the patterns of culture and, and, and what people accept as right and what people accept as wrong what people accept as good and evil and what choices they make in their lives and how they fundamentally perceive reality and make jo uh, choices so selfishness and benevolence are not mutually exclusive but interestingly, I think altruism and benevolence are mutually exclusive. You know, just try and live consistently altruistically to just serve everyone else other than yourself. Because if you manage to do it, then you've achieved the impossible. Because the proponents of altruism say that you should only, that your happiness is dictated by the happiness you provide to others. And it's still selfish if you do something for others and get a sense of happiness out of it. It's an impossible doctrine to hold up to. You can't be consistently altruistic. Because even if you do something for someone else, you have to take no pleasure, no happiness, nothing out of it for you to be consistently altruistic. It's impossible. I'd love to see anyone try and do it. All they'll achieve is death. Anyway, right, moving on from ethics. Hopefully the last, last topic is politics. Now, I'm, I'm going to kind of try and kind of breeze over this just because, like I said, say, you'll get a lot more information than I can provide in the next sort of 10 minutes or so from Anthony's um, blog essay on declarationism. Um, 
So we've got a nice picture of what I, I think. I don't know if that's a, an accurate picture or not. There were several on there. That's Declaration of Independence. Uh, looks like yeah. Yeah. Sorry. But anyway. Right. So that that's what the, what the um, picture is, and necessarily any political system has to be logically dictated by the morality which underpins it, the, the ethics which underpins it. <coughs> So what Ayn Rand proposed was that the only political system that's consistently ethical was laissez-faire capitalism, that government only existed to secure the rights of man. Now, without going into any kind of like, like ec ec economical theories, whether it's capitalism versus you know, government stimulus or anything like that, you know, I, I personally, I couldn't give a shit whether or not one particular economic system or government in intervention in an e economy was more beneficial to the economy and more beneficial to everyone than the other. The problem I've got is whether or not it's, eth it's ethical, whether it's moral or not, for government to do anything other than just protect our rights, to hold the monopoly on force and remove force from man's relationships with each other so that we can just deal with each other as traders, as individuals. So, another quote then to kind of explain that and summarise it. If physical force is to be barred from social relationships, men need an institution charged with the task of protecting their rights under an objective code of rules. This is the task of government, of a proper government. Its basic task, its only moral justification, and the reason why men do need a government a government is the means of placing the retaliatory use of physical force under objective control, i.e. under objectively defined laws. Now I used to, when I first got into kind of like objectivism, used to think that anarchy, that there wasn't necessarily a role for government. I was a bit maybe naive thinking that every man is going to be completely rational and hold a completely rational set of, set of morals and um, we'd all be able to live in this wonderful, perfect world where everyone adhered to all of that. But uh, unfortunately, that doesn't happen. So this is the reason why man necessarily needs government, because man has to choose to be rational, has to choose reason, has to choose existence, has to choose all these absolutes. And some men don't choose it. They're the moochers and looters. And the only reason government should exist is to protect our rights, protect our life from those people. So the main political conflict then is capitalism or individualism or whatever word you want to use to connotate it versus collectivism or, or socialism or whatever word you want to use again. Uh, I, I thought this picture was just quite funny. But you've got socialism or collectivism. That's basically where you live for your own life and you gain all your goals and you achieve all your values and then someone comes along and gets government or themselves with a gun to say, actually, no, we need that. So we're going to take it from you. So that's a bit odd, considering what code of morals we've just dictated. Capitalism, on the other hand, means that you can achieve all your values and they belong to you. And whether or not this represents you as an individual and you can protect you know, your property in your own life, or whether this is metaphorically representing government, protecting you know, the moochers from stealing your values, is irrelevant. But that's basically the general gist of the two conflicts. It's either you get to live for your own life and gain your own values, or you have to do it for someone else, whether by force or you know, fraud or whatever. So, we end on these simple choices then. Existence versus non-existence, reason versus faith, self-interest versus altruism, capitalism versus collectivism. And hopefully I've shown that, logically, we can answer these latter questions by understanding the basis of these former fundamental conflicts. And I think that's it. Any questions? So, so basically, what, what, um, sorry, what was your name? Uh, Neil. Neil. What Neil was asking is, um, you know, at what point should government play a role in, in regulating? Is that yeah. a good word to use? Yeah. In, in regulating, you know, essentially what is uh, man's relationships with, with, with each other. Like, um, you were talking on the level of sort of like, like businesses and corporate uh, things, but it, it, it's irrelevant whether or not it's a business or whether or not it's two individual men dealing with each other. 
I think the problem is, as soon as we start to get government to regulate things, we're removing the personal responsibility. If, for example, I'm a customer and I come in to buy a product, there, there's responsibility on both ends of the trade involved. There's a responsibility of me, of not being a naive dumbass and finding out exactly what it is that I'm giving my money for. And there's a responsibility on the client to provide me with the correct information about the product and not try and defraud me and give me something that I think I'm paying for and yet I received something different. Now, th this is one of the reasons why, why government should have a court system to deal with these ty types of things, an objective set of laws to say that, you know, basically, you know, fraud is, is no different than, than any kind of force. It's just, you know, semantics, re really. Uh, in sort of like practice, it's different, but the end result is the same. And I think that, you know, as, long as, it, as soon as government starts interfering in those sorts of things, it removes personal responsibility. And, you know, and personal choice, you know, you may, you may, some people may learn that something in a product is bad for them, but it still should be their choice whether or not they, you know, deem that product is still being valuable to them or whether or not they want that. You know, for example, like we, the majority of us were out having a few drinks last night. I'm under no sort of impression that alcohol is good for me. It is good for my health, but I enjoyed it. And, and I think the, the choice should be my own to, to buy that. Um, I was just showing Anthony in the uh, Metro this morning, there's been some calls to legalize all, form, all forms of drugs and, and you know I, I think that, that that's what should what should happen it, you know the personal choice should be made by the person who is making that you know it should be individual what do you then uh, intervene say addict so at what point say uh, take the drugs Ennis. at what point do you say that there is actually need, uh, an intervention to say let's break the dependency and give them choices back for their life if you like well uh, this I don't think is, is, is by any means a, a role for, for government because the problem with, with government is, is to perform those sorts of actions, it has to have money or something from somewhere else. Now, if it's not generating... James, just to add real quick, um, just so you can say it, yep. if you're thinking the same along the same lines, wouldn't the point that would government step in be when that person hurts someone else if they did do that with their drug abuse? Yeah. Right? Yes, yeah, absolutely. You know, if... if if the person who's, an, who's abusing drugs or wh whatever initiates physical force or any kind of kind of um, force into into a relationship with whoever, then you know that is would be deemed evil, illegal, and government should step in. But in terms of helping that person to get away from their drug dependency, you know that has to be on, on sort of various levels. It has to be their own personal choice. It has to be, um, and, and then outside of that, it should be. You know the benevolence of whoever they're personally relate, related with, either their family or friends. It has to be their choice as well to decide to help them. Government shouldn't be able to. You know, it'd be no different than. As a, there was a brilliant um, video, and I can't remember uh, what it, the name of the video, but I'll try and remember it, and I'll, I'll try and tell you. But basically, it was the extent of um, similar sort of scenario. So and so's neighbour um, couldn't afford to go to college or whatever. So, um, you know. Two, two friends, one of them decided to be benevolent, give him some money because he you know, obviously thought it was valuable to help him put him through college. The other friend didn't want to. So instead, the friend that gave him money decided to go and get a group of people to sign some forms and have a vote to see whether or not the other person had to give him money or not. It's the same role with government. It's basically, instead of you, uh, one person forcing another person, it's just getting another organisation to take money or force that person to perform an action which they may ne not necessarily want to do themselves. And I think those sorts of relationships should be brought down to a more sort of like individual level. They should be dictated by the person, in, person involved and the person, people around them, their personal choices, rather than being forced to do something by, by government or any other kind of like organisation or, or individuals. Does that answer your question? Anything else? So you can, anyone can come speak to me afterwards. Yeah.